Serena Williams has had many unforgettable major victories. She won the 1999 US Open by defeating five future Hall of Famers in a row. She remarkably claimed the 2015 French Open while battling a debilitating flu virus. She even won the 2017 Australian Open while pregnant. Yet, out of her 23 major singles titles, the 2007 Australian Open stands unparalleled as she overcame the darkest moment of her life to reignite her greatness. The first six episodes of the ESPN Plus in the Arena Serena Williams docuseries chronicling Serena Williams' tennis career are out now, and I admit I am a bit late with my analysis. I combined my breakdown of episodes one and two into one video, but I felt that the episode three titled Point of No Return deserved its own spotlight. Not only is it the best episode of the docuseries thus far, but it also delves into what may be the most challenging and transformative period of Serena's entire career. Hey, my name is Christian Bastnight and welcome to Christian's Court, where I cover tennis from all angles. If you have not yet already, make sure you subscribe and click that notification bell so you're notified whenever I post more in the arena docuseries episode breakdown. Episode two of In the Arena left us with Serena Williams being on top of the tennis world, winning her fifth major title and completing the Serena Slam in 2003, winning four consecutive major singles titles and beating her sister Venus in all four of those finals. Family is a central theme in this third episode as we see appearances from Serena's two older half-sisters, Isha and Lindrea. Venus, who was featured in the first two episodes of the series, was absent in this one. The docuseries briefly touches upon some of the animosity the sisters faced, both from their peers and the media. Both Martina Hingis and Martina Navratilova accused the Williams sisters of benefiting and getting away with certain things because they were black. Mind you, such statements were made after Serena and Venus were victims of racism at the 2001 Indian Wells Tournament, but... Alas, Serena also talks about how many critics and trolls would accuse her and Venus of being men. Back then in the early 2000s, the women's players were not really friendly, but the Williams sisters further isolated themselves from the field. Isha and Lindrea said that they kept a very tight-knit circle comprised primarily of family. They said it felt like it was us against the world to them. Serena says she also got accustomed to people not cheering for her even when she played in the States at home. Now, focusing on 2003, her last match of that season was the woman in finals where she once again beat Venus, who was suffering from a season-ending abdominal injury. Serena was practically an unstoppable force, and if it weren't for adjusting in it in her hand, she might have been going for the calendar slam heading into that year's US Open. Unfortunately, injury would have prevented this from happening anyways. At a party after July's ESPY Awards, Serena revealed that she was dancing to Lil Jon's 2003 classic, Get Low, and as Williams was getting low on the dance floor, she felt a crack and she instantly knew that she needed surgery and she never needed surgery before in her career. Williams said that her quadriceps muscle detached from her knee and floated up to her thigh and that the doctor had to bring that muscle back down and reattach it to her knee. Serena's eldest half-sister, Yatunde or Tunde for short, was a nurse and acted as Serena's caregiver after the surgery and she traveled to LA to check on her. Yatunde was the eldest of the five sisters and she acted almost as a mother figure, especially to Serena who was the youngest out of the five. Even as a teenager, Tunde took her younger sisters back to school shopping and she spent all her own money on them to help them pick out new clothes. Serena didn't get to spend as much time with Tunde who stayed back in LA to complete nursing school while the rest of the family moved to Florida where Serena and Venus continued to train as juniors at the Rick Macy Tennis Academy. Tunde eventually had three children, two sons and a daughter, so she had her own life, but she and Serena remained close. She did Williams' hair and was Venus and Serena's personal assistant for a little while. On September 14, 2003, life for the Williams family would never be the same. Serena was in Toronto filming for a TV show called Street Time. That night, Serena's mother, Orsine, called her at 4 a.m. worried and asked if she had heard from Tunde, fearing that something bad might have happened. When Serena called Tunde's house, her cousin answered the phone and said that she was involved in a shooting and had passed away. When Serena called her mother to relay the news, Orsine knew what was up before Serena even had to say a word, saying, My baby's gone, isn't she? Just gut-wrenching. Court proceedings would later reveal that Tunde, 31 at the time, was talking with her boyfriend in her white SUV parked outside what was subsequently revealed to be a crack house in Compton just a mile away from where 
Venus and Serena trained on the public courts as children. Two members of the Southside Compton Crip Street Gang who were guarding the house from rival gangs mistakenly believed that Tunde's SUV belonged to a rival member and they opened fire on it. Tunde was shot and did not survive her gunshot wounds while her boyfriend survived the altercation. Tunde's three children were all under 12 at the time and Serena recalls the family playing round after round of Uno to distract themselves from the grief. In 2016, Serena and Venus returned to Compton to open the Utunde Price Resource Center, which offers programs to assist those impacted by violence and trauma. In 2018, minutes before taking the court to play Jocanta in the opening round of the Silicon Valley Classic, Serena found out that one of the gunmen responsible for Yatunde's murder was released on parole earlier that year. Clearly shaken up, Williams was handed the most lopsided loss of her career, only winning one game against the Brit Conta. Serena's 2003 knee operation was serious, and she really should have been sidelined for at least a year. But fueled by a desire to get back on tour and distract herself from her sister's murder, Williams returned six months later for the 2004 Miami Open, which she won with considerable ease. However, the competition in that Miami tournament wasn't as stiff, and Serena's relatively weaker form was exposed soon after. Williams lost in the quarterfinals of that year's Roland Garros and U.S. Open to Jennifer Capriati both times. She did reach her third consecutive Wimbledon final, where she was infamously outclassed by 17-year-old Maria Sharapova in straight sets. Serena was not the same dominant force as she was in 2002 and in 2003. The serve lost a little bit of its potency, but more importantly, Williams' forehand was a clear Achilles heel and was far too inconsistent. She also wasn't entirely there mentally and had not truly processed the emotions of losing her eldest sister. Whenever Serena did win, she said it felt like more of a chore and was not enjoyable for her. Still, Williams got revenge over Sharapova at the 2005 Australian Open, saving three match points to escape the Russian in the semifinals, before beating Lindsay Davenport to hoist her seventh major title, of course, in the final. With Williams back in the winner's circle and being ranked second in the world, it seemed like she was returning to her dominant winning ways. But she soon after suffered an ankle injury at the Amelia Island Tournament, which forced her to miss Roland Garros. Williams did not reach another quarterfinal for the remainder of that year, falling early at Wimbledon and the U.S. Open. Serena said that when she arrived at the 2006 Australian Open as the defending champion, she was in a bad place mentally and was going through a lot behind the scenes. The emotions of losing Tunde finally caught up to Williams, and this time, it was impossible for her to shut them out. She started questioning why she was even out there on the court competing. And I'm thinking at this point, what is my motivation? You know, what am I playing for? Is there a reason that tennis is in my life still? Williams was bounced in the third round by Daniela Hanchakova in straight sets, which would be her first and only loss to the Slovakian. The New York Times' Christopher Clary wrote, Her victory in Melbourne a year ago is looking much more like an anomaly instead of the precursor to another dominant phase that some predicted. Williams reveals in the docuseries that she actually retired in 2006, but she never made a formal announcement. She told the press her reasons for skipping all the big tournaments were due to a knee injury, but in reality, Serena was depressed. She reveals in her 2009 autobiography On the Line that she didn't touch a racket for months and she did not speak to any family members for weeks. Amidst all this, Williams faced considerable criticism for her supposed lack of dedication to the sport. Hall of Famer Chris Everett published an open letter to Serena and Tennis Magazine. Everett's letter reads, Dear Serena, I've been thinking about your career and something is troubling me. I appreciate that becoming a well-rounded person is important to you as you've made that desire very clear. Still, a question lingers. Do you ever consider your place in history? Is it something you care about? In the short term, you may be happy with the various things going on in your life, but I wonder whether 20 years from now, you might reflect on your career and regret not putting 100% of yourself into tennis. Because whether you want to admit it or not, these distractions are tarnishing your legacy. Just a couple of years ago, when you were fully committed to the game, you showed athleticism, shot making, and competitive desire to become the greatest player ever. Many besides my 
myself shared the same sentiment. You won five out of the six Grand Slams you entered over the 2002 and 2003 seasons, and you looked utterly dominant in the process. Then you got sidetracked with injuries, pet projects, and indifference, and have only won one major in the last seven you've played. I find those results hard to fathom. You're simply too good not to be winning two Grand Slams a year. You're still only 24, well within your prime. These are crucial years that you'll never get back. Why not dedicate yourself entirely for the next five years and see what you can achieve? Perhaps the reason I feel so strongly about this is because I wasn't blessed with the physical gifts you possess. I know that the lifespan of an athlete's greatness is brief and should be exploited. Once you get to number one in the world and start winning major titles, you should see how far you can take it. You've become very good at many things, but how many people would trade that to be great at just one thing? I don't see how acting and designing clothes can compete with the pride of being the best tennis player in the world. Your other accomplishments just can't measure up to what you can do with a racket in your hand. Ironically, I believe that if you fulfill your potential on the tennis court, all your other endeavors will become that much easier to pursue. You can become the most famous athlete in the world. Every magazine will want you to be on its cover, and any door you wish to walk through will be wide open. When I was playing, I always knew there would be time to get married, have children, do TV commentating, and even coach if I wanted. I assure you there would be time for you to chase all your dreams once you're through with tennis. I offer this only as advice, not criticism, from someone with experience. If you're completely happy with the way your life is, then crumple up this letter and throw it away. I wish you nothing but luck and success in all your pursuits. Just remember that you have in front of you an opportunity of the rarest kind to become the greatest ever at something. I hope you make the most of it. When asked about Everett's letter, Williams said, I didn't read any of that stuff. You don't know what happens behind closed doors and what people are really going through. So until they figure that one out, as far as I'm concerned, I don't listen to all that stuff. Another 18-time major singles champion, Martina Navratilova, had similar critiques of Williams. Williams. Serena has a gift and she's not utilizing it, Navratilova said. What you really regret are the things you didn't do. Will she get it together or will she fall so low that she'll need wildcard invitations? She may find by then that her head will be there, but her body won't. It's a sad situation. Serena should be in her physical prime, but she is wasting time you cannot ever get back. She had the opportunity to be the greatest in history. Instead, she'll be a supernova who burst onto the scene and then she was gone. As you could hear, the narrative during 2006 was that Serena was just lazy and her heart wasn't into tennis because she was distracted by with other outside interests. This was a very lazy and just tired take because Serena and Venus were always multifaceted and doing fashion shoots and acting. In some of their prime years, the very early 2000s, Time Magazine referred to them as part-time players because they intentionally played lighter schedules to pursue other interests like fashion. But now when Serena was flopping, the critics pointed to this outside tennis stuff as the culprits when it was both injury and Serena still grieving the loss of her sister Yatunde. I find it interesting how back then the media criticized the sisters for not being quote one-dimensional fools as Richard would say. This deal sounds too good to be true. Are you trying to set us up? We've made some deals before. But this? This can't be legal. A big and tasty for just one dollar. I believe their willingness to pursue other avenues like fashion and TV paved the way for the stars of today to do the same. Jill Smoller, Serena's longtime agent, advised Serena to seek therapy during her funk in 2006. This would be Williams' first time ever seeking counseling because therapy was deemed more taboo within the black community. Talking through her emotions helped Serena, but as she reveals in her autobiography, what truly inspired her to return to the courts was a young black girl recognizing her coming out of a donut shop. That girl told Serena that her best tennis was yet to come. The following day, she signed up for the Cincinnati Open, slated for July. Ranked 139th, her lowest in nearly a decade, Serena made the semis in that tournament before losing to Vera Zvonareva in straight sets. A month later, she competed at a U.S. Open lead-up tournament in Los Angeles, reaching the Final Four yet again, this time falling to Yelena Yankovic. Serena made a valiant effort at that summer's U.S. Open, reaching the fourth round before being eliminated by top-ranked Amelie Moresmo in three sets. Serena wouldn't compete on tour for the remainder of 2006, and she took a trip to Africa in November with her sisters and mother, 
to help UNICEF build beds to fight against malaria. Williams recalls visiting a slave dungeon and seeing a sign saying Point of No Return, which of course is the episode's title. Seeing what her enslaved ancestors had to go through was powerful to Serena. Serena said that she felt she would be letting her ancestors down if she couldn't properly show up and be strong out there on court. An inspired Williams played her first tournament of the 2007 season at a small tier four tournament in Hobart. She lost to 56 ranked Sibyl Bammer in the quarterfinals. Bammer, by the way, is one of the few people to have a perfect unbeaten record against Williams as she also took her down two years later in Cincinnati. Serena was discouraged by this loss to Bammer, believing that setbacks like this shouldn't occur if she were to reclaim her position at the top of the women's tour. Serena initially sulked, but then she was jolted by motivation. She went for a early run and she started doing sprints and calisthenics. Williams was determined to be fit in time for next week's Australian Open. Serena told the press that she was confident that she wasn't too far away from her former Grand Slam glory. I love doubters because I love more than anything. What I love, besides obviously winning, is proving people wrong. Like I always say, I believe in myself more than you know anyone. And I, even though it was hard, you know, I, I really believed in me and in my game. If I play well and I do the things that I need to do, it's really hard for anyone in the women's tour to beat me. But 1987 woman and champion Pat Cash said that she was delusional and that she could never ascend back to number one. Heading into Melbourne, you think that Serena would have little to no pressure. She had just suffered a bad loss at a small lead-up tournament and was unseated, ranked 81st in the world. But before Serena even played her first match, she faced significant adversity. First, Serena was body shamed by the Aussie press, one paper labeling her a cow. One reporter wrote, There was always a sense with Williams, who was looking more than a few pounds overweight in a lime green dress, which was doing her no favors, that she expects to win matches as if it is her divine right. Many of her off-season workouts involved a remote control and a 50-inch plasma screen. That's so, that's so out of pocket. In her autobiography, Serena wrote, the mean-spirited comments about my fitness and game were rooted in truth. I was a little heavy, maybe 20 pounds heavier than I wanted to be at that point. Still, Williams did not look that heavy and overweight to me at least, and as she says in her docuseries, much of that criticism was rooted from a lot of the white media just not being accustomed to Williams' curvier body shape. When I got to Melbourne, I remember wearing like, some white tights and then the next day i was on the cover of the paper and it was calling me a whale this one australian paper referred to her as a cow she has gotten overweight she is not interested she's much more concerned about her design business she's a big girl and a beautiful girl we looked at her and we thought she was overweight she does look like she's taking the comeback seriously though but she still does need to get in shape Absolutely. she has a ways to go they're used to seeing women that didn't have a figure, and I was a black woman with a figure, and that doesn't make you fat or doesn't make you a well. It just makes you a girl with a butt and a small waist. Thankfully, you don't really hear the media comment like that about players' bodies nowadays, but I think it's still very commendable for Serena and how she handled it so well because I know a lot of players would be demoralized. But that's not all. Just as Williams was preparing for her opening round match against 27th seed Mara Santangelo, a Nike representative pulled up on her in the players' lounge and said that the sports apparel brand would threaten to end her five-year multi-million dollar contract if she did not do well in this tournament. The ultimatum was said to be make the quarterfinals or better. This understandably put even more pressure on Williams. And from her perspective, it was kind of unfair as she was dealing with both injury and depression after she signed with the company in late 2003. However, she only earned one single title in the span of two years, so Nike was not satisfied with their investment. Still, Williams brushed this unsettling encounter aside and dispatched of Santangelo 6261. She then beat qualifier on Kramer 76. 6 2, but she suffered a nasty blister on her foot during this match, which impacted her throughout the tournament. To make matters worse, Williams contracted a cult before playing fifth seed Nadia Petrova in round three. Petrova was a big serving and big ball striking Russian who was in much better form than Serena coming into this tournament. Despite Williams holding a 5 to 1 head to head advantage over Petrova, commentators were almost certain that Nadia would send Williams packing, and it looked like that would be the case. The Russian led the 25 year old Serena 6 1 5 3 and was pointing away from advancing to the second week. However, with her back against the wall, Williams hit a back can and let out a loud, almost primal grunt. Oh, Belief 
Belief. Belief. Serena said that grunt was the big awakening that changed the entire course of the match and really tournament for her. She recounts in her autobiography, it was just a release for all that pressure I was feeling from the start of the tournament. Everything came together after that. I was still down a set, two points from losing the match, but I knew it was mine. Serena eventually turned that match around, winning it 1-6, 7-5, 6-3 to make the second week. This win was significant for Williams for many reasons. She had beaten a top 10 player for the first time in two years, but more importantly, she clawed back from the brink of defeat and got it done in three sets, proving to herself that she was indeed fit enough to perhaps go all the way. Serena picked up more blisters on her foot and she soaked her feet every day after she hobbled off the court. During her off day, Serena locked in, doing sprints and rewatching old match footage. That all clearly paid off as she spanked 11th ranked Yelena Yankovic in the fourth round, 6 3 6 2. This was undoubtedly the best display of tennis we had seen from Williams in years as she was truly firing on all cylinders. It's also worth mentioning that Williams used a new racket during this tournament, a blacked out Wilson prototype meant for Roger Federer. This racket frame was clearly much smaller than that large frying pan of a racket she had been using the last couple of seasons, and I think this racket change gave her some added control. Williams' quarterfinal match against 16th seed Sir Har Pair was undoubtedly her most drama filled of the tournament. After splitting the first two sets, Williams looked well on her way to victory, leading the Israeli 4 to 1 in the decider. However, the American clearly felt the pressure of returning to the final four as she stopped moving her feet and accelerating completely through her shots. Serena lost the next five of six games to allow a pair to serve for the match at 6-5. Here Williams was two points away from defeat but relied on her champion instinct to buckle down and take the two and a half hour thriller with a final score of 3-6, 6-2-8-6. Serena finished the match with 30 winners to 49 unforced errors so it was clear that she'd have to clean things up if she wanted a shot at the title. She did a good job of this for her semi-final against 17 year old big ball striking Czech Nicole Vitasova. Williams saved a set point in the opener before surviving Vitasova in two sets, 7-6, 6-4. Serena's opponent in the final would be another hard-hitting teen, the top-seeded Maria Sharapova. This would be their first meeting in two years, where Serena won their epic Australian Open semifinal in 2005. At this point, both Serena's cold and blister had gone, and she felt that she had played herself into fitness and form. Still, Hall of Famer and commentator Tracy Austin said that while the American had a good run to the final, Sharapova would have no trouble with her. Williams wrote that Austin's comments were mean and unnecessary, but she used them as fuel to prove her wrong. Serena was also motivated by her opponent on the other side of the net. Williams did not take that 2004 woman in loss to Sharapova well at all, and she mentions in the docuseries that she vowed to never lose to Maria again. I said to myself, one thing I can promise is God is my witness. She's never beaten me again. Never, ever, 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 ever. Ever. Serena actually did lose her next match to Maria, which was at the 2004 WTA Year and Championships final. Williams let Sharapova for love in the deciding set of that match, although in her defense, she suffered from an abdominal strain and could not serve. To me, I think that this was the match that further solidified Serena's low-key hatred for Sharapova, as Maria gave this extra tail reaction after claiming victory. It also didn't help that Sharapova was thought to be Serena's ender by many people in the tennis world, and she received far more endorsement opportunities despite not accomplishing nearly as much. Still, Maria around this time was the favorite for many other people besides Austin. She had won the US Open months prior and was guaranteed to be the new world number one after the tournament. Not to mention the final would be held indoors, which would surely help the double fault prone Sharapova. Meanwhile, Williams hadn't contested in a final in two years and questions remained about her fitness after playing all those matches. But going into this final, Serena was inspired by men's finalist Francisco Gonzalez and his ability to play high risk, low unforced air tennis. And that's exactly what she did against Sharapova. And what remains her best performance in a Grand Slam final, Williams unleashed 28 winners to just 11 unforced airs, demolishing the top seeded Sharapova 6 1 6 2 in just 63 minutes. The result left spectators and commentators alike speechless, as this was one of the biggest tennis upsets at the time, perhaps even more shocking than when Maria beat Serena at Wimbledon two and a half years earlier. Here, an overweight, out of shape, and seemingly un 
dedicated Williams to fight nearly everyone's expectations to claim her third Australian Open and eighth Grand Slam overall. The American, who became the third lowest ranked woman to win a major singles title at the time, saw her ranking skyrocket to world number 14. Even more impressive is Williams had to slay six seeded players en route to the trophy. I still think that's never been done before in, in tennis history in the open era at least. But perhaps even more powerful is Serena's trophy acceptance speech where at the end she dedicated the win to her sister Tunde. It wasn't very long, just two lines as Serena choked back tears, but it was so meaningful. This was the first time that Serena openly spoke about Tunde after her passing. I would like to dedicate this win to my sister who's not here. Her name is Yatunde and I just love her so much. I'll try not to get teary-eyed, but um, a couple days ago I said, if I win this, it's gonna be for her, so thanks, Tundi. She didn't do this dedication after she won the 2005 Australian Open. She hadn't truly processed and grieved then, but now she was a changed woman, having finally released all that bottled up pain. That's why this tournament was so meaningful to Williams. For those two arduous years, Serena didn't have any control over the narrative surrounding her. She endured so much unnecessary criticism and was told that she was undedicated, fat, and wasting away her gifts. But here, with the winner's trophy in hand, Serena began to write her own story, and that was just the first chapter of Serena. 2.0. That is it for my In the Arena episode 3 breakdown. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts were on it and whether you also shed a thug tear like me at the end. Again, make sure you all are subscribed and click that notification bell so you're notified whenever I post my next In the Arena breakdown which will be a combined episode 4 and 5 analysis. That's going to cover more aspects of Serena 2.0, including when she went from nearly losing her life to becoming the greatest player of all time. Thank y'all so much for watching, for your support, and I'll see y'all next time here on Christian's Court.